Okay, good morning, ladies. I hope you had a nice little extra space in your week last week without having class. I think sometimes a little extra space is good. No sunburn. No sunburn. I did well. Sunscreened it up. Uh, yes, we had a really, really great week. I was just joking with this table over here that sometimes when you go away, it's a trip, right? You're like moving and all these different things that you're seeing. And I love trips. We go on trips with my family. Um, but this, we just did a pure vacation. And it was so fun just being um, in Mexico with the family. And my husband and I played pickleball. We played beach volleyball. We went sailing. Like, it's just like all the, all the things. It was really good. So I had a great time with my family. I feel like as the kids are now at an age where they are in school and in their activities that like pulling back in vacation time has become more and more important to me because we just get to like be together as a family. And it's a great way to just leave everything of the fast pacedness of our culture right now. So, um, so that brings us to back to class ladies and we have four weeks on Deuteronomy, which is kind of crazy to me as I've been studying it. My husband was laughing at me because I was like, I read 200 pages of commentary for today. And he was like, what? So my big um, realization actually of Deuteronomy is how much I love it. And I think that we're going to need to return to it at some point, probably not in the next year or two. But I think at some point I, I want to return to it and do it in a bigger way because it's really profound and beautiful. And what I, one of the commentators I was reading was really talking about is that Deuteronomy is the most theology of any of the books of the Pentateuch. Like up into this, we get the occurrences, the laws, the narratives and the things that are happening. And what we're going to see today as we begin to go into it is Deuteronomy is theology of what's happened. It's a sermon two, actually three sermons on what has happened. And so Moses is looking back and he's beginning to make sense of everything that God has already brought them through. And so this commentator I'm reading said the greatest comparison he would do to the New Testament would be the book of John because the first three gospels, the synoptics, are really about what happened, how it happened, when it happened. And then you get to John and John has more comments on why it was meaningful and why it was significant. We get all the great I am statements in John. So he, I thought that was a really interesting comparison to think of Deuteronomy as a lot like John when in sort of its perspective. Uh, let me pray for us and then we will we'll dive in. Jesus, thank you for this time that we have in your word and thank you for this time that we can pause and be still in your presence. I pray that as um, we dive into your word, that you open it up, that our hearts and our minds would understand it. I pray that we would come to know you better by this time in your word, that we come to see your love for us even more. I pray that you pour out your spirit among all of us, that you would bind the things that are distracting us right now, and we just bind them in the name of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that you will allow us to focus our hearts and our minds here, pour out wisdom and knowledge into all of our hearts and minds that we may see deep into your word and allow me to teach only what is true. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we are in our fifth book of the Torah, ladies, uh, which is also called the Law, the Writings of Moses, or the Law of Moses. But as we have been calling it, uh, Torah means instruction, the instruction into the Word of God. So as just sort of a very brief recap, as we are now in our fifth book, that Genesis is the story of creation, fall, revelation, and covenant. Exodus is the story of redemption, right? Of God intervening to redeem and to take his people out of Egypt. His goal, as we saw, is relationship. That the Israelite, that through the Israelites, Yahweh would showcase his character, his nature to the entire world. That he is a God that desires to dwell in the midst of of his people. If the Israelites will obey God and keep his covenant, then out of all the nations, they will be his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Since Yahweh's goal is relationship, 
He presents the Israelites with Torah, with instruction, instruction on how to maintain his presence and his blessing among them. How can these unholy people maintain the presence of a holy God in their midst? So Exodus, Leviticus, and prior numbers describe how to live out redeemed set apart lives, how to maintain Yahweh's presence, which is often done through ritual, how to cleanse from sin and keep the space pure so that Yahweh can dwell in their midst. Sin must be dealt with because sin separates people from their loving but holy God. Numbers also tells the story of the journey to Canaan, of their initial faltering in faith that keeps them from entering after two years and of the sentence that all of those over 20 must pass away before they can enter into the promised land. So for Yahweh will bring their children to Canaan to rest. Numbers uh, pretty much skips over the 38 years of the desert wandering after that, um, picks up the narrative as the new generation of Israelites is camped at Moab across from Jericho, adjacent to the land of Canaan, to the land that's promised to Abe and his ancestors. And this then is where Deuteronomy begins, as they are camped in Moab, across from Jericho. So we're going to start with the context of Deuteronomy, which is similar to most of the Pentateuch. Ladies, uh, you can open up to Deuteronomy 1.1. We will be beginning there today. So in Hebrew, Deuteronomy is called the Book of Words, which is taken from the very first words of the Book of Deuteronomy. If you read it, it begins with, these are the words Moses spoke. So in Hebrew, this becomes the title of Deuteronomy is the book of words. But actually, um, that's not what Deuteronomy means. So the Hebrew title is the book of words, but the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which began in the third century BC, translates it um, as Deuteronomium, I'm sorry, long word, let's try this again, Deuteronomium, which is Latin for meaning second law, or Greek, sorry, for meaning second law. So it reiterates the law that was first presented in Exodus again. So the title Deuteronomy comes from the Greek translation, from the LXX. In Hebrew, if you were to look at a Hebrew Bible, it would still be the Hebrew for um, the book of words. Um, Who is our author? Now, interestingly, Deuteronomy says more about its author than any of the other books of the Pentateuch. So if again, if we go back to 1-1, Deuteronomy 1-1, it says, these are the words Moses spoke to all of Israel. So who, ladies, was the initial speaker of these words? It's Moses, exactly. We also learn that Moses writes down the words of Deuteronomy and commands them to be read regularly. If you actually skip over, we'll come back to Deuteronomy 1.1, but if you actually skip over to all the way to chapter 31, and um, I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. This is towards the very end of Deuteronomy. So 31.9, it says, So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, At the end of every seven years, in the year for canceling debts, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law or this Torah before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully the words of this Torah. Their children who do not know this Torah must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess. So Moses wrote down this Torah, this instruction, and according to verse 9, who does he give it to? Who does it say? It says the, the priests, exactly, and the elders. Now, how often does he command it to be read out loud, verses 10 and 11? He says every every seven years. Good. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament attribute the writing of the Torah to Moses. 
Uh, but we'll see that there are some later editorial comments added, like Moses' death. Moses is clearly not going to write about his own death, right? That does not detract from us believing that this is still the word of God that a later commentator has come in and added about Moses' death. Um, likely early scribes edited it that were still in the tradition of Moses. Now, keep your finger here, and we will come back to it. But I'm going to turn back to Deuteronomy 1.1 1, 1 again. Still thinking of context. So, uh, so who is Deuteronomy written to? So if we continue to read Deuteronomy 1, again, it says, these are the words that Moses spoke to all of Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan, that is in the Arabah, opposite to Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazareth, and Diz Dizahab. You can see the point is, he's been very precise on where they are. So this is great historical information, and it means we should read this as historically accurate. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. This was after he had defeated Sihon, king of Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, and Adri had defeated Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Eshteroth. East of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law. All right, so verse 1, all of these words are written to who? To the Israelites, exactly. Now, wait for just a second. Which Israelites? We actually learn this based on the location, based again on the context. So, um, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And where are the Israelites right now? So verse 1, it says, in the wilderness of where? In the wilderness of the Jordan, yeah. Um, and then verse 9, it says, in the territory of who? Territory of Moab, right? Territory of Moab. So this again shows us the Deuteronomy picks up exactly where numbers left off, because that's where numbers ended. That They were camped in Moab across from Jericho across the Jordan River. Now, verse 3 gives us the when. It says, this occurs when? What does it say? In the 40th year, the first day of the 11th month. Now, what are we counting from? The 40th year since what? Since the Exodus. Exactly. So, and it's not just the 40th year. It's the 40th year of the 11th month. Now, 12 months in a year, right? So we are at the very end of the 40th year, which tells us that we are at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. We are at the very end of the wilderness journey. So which Israelites is Moses addressing? You can answer this. Which ones? The next generation, exactly. This is very specific. These are not the older Israelites that have already passed away. This is the next generation. These are those who are ready to take Canaan. They are the children of faith who have not have been forced to die in the desert. So some of the Israelites standing before Moses were born into slavery, but they would have been at the very oldest late teens. Because if you think that everyone... 20 or over has passed away. Plus, this was made about two years, this, um, uh, this instruction was given two years into their journey. So two years into their journey. So the very oldest, someone would have been 18 when they would have left, left Egypt. Does that make sense? And so the very oldest would have been 18. The rest were all younger than that who are now the adults standing before Moses, plus their own children who have been born during this whole desert wandering experience. So some standing there were born into slavery, but they would have been teenagers at the, at the oldest, at the most, when they were born into slavery. Now, these that are standing there had been born into the hardship of the desert existence, but they had been born learning to trust in Yahweh, they had seen the cloud that had led them by day and the fire that had led them by night. Many had fought against the Amorite king Sihon and the and Og king of Bashan. They had seen God fight for them. This generation has come of age during or been born into the experience of faith. They have witnessed and experienced and lived out faith. 
So, but as I always remind us, we always still have to remember that those who are being addressed are a nomadic, Semitic people 3,500 3, years ago, right? That they are vastly different from us. And so we have to understand the context to really understand um, the meaning. And as I always like to say, Deuteronomy was not written to us, but it was written for us, exactly, that we would learn who God is and who we are in relationship to God through what we study. When was Deuteronomy written? Well, we believe that Moses dies in 1406 BC, so probably just right before he dies. This is, we believe, kind of his last will and testimony in many ways. What type of writing is, is Deuteronomy? Well, like Genesis and Exodus and, and the whole Pentateuch, it is theological history. It is real history intended to teach theology. But within that, there's a very specific genre that Deuteronomy is. And so if we go back to 1-1, let's read that one more time. It says, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel. So these are the words that Moses did what? That he read, that he spoke. Exactly. So Deuteronomy is actually three speeches three sermons of Moses to this newly formed group of young-ish Israelites ready to enter the land of Canaan. It's his parting words to the new generation. It's really, in many ways, his final sort of um, deathbed speech. Moses knows he's going to die. So what are the final things he's going to tell this next generation? He knows that Joshua has come in commissioned to lead and that he is going to die. What will he tell them? What will he remind them of before he leaves? We think of like a pastor leaving a church that what are his last words? What does he want these people to know before he passes? So Moses is this departing pastor desiring to see his people thrive in their relationship with Yahweh, but knowing he will no longer be there to help them through their struggles. And this brings us to the purpose. And so I'm going to turn back to chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. Again, I'll read those one more time. What is the purpose of Deuteronomy? So verses 12 and 13, he says, Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. All right, so the goal of hearing these words of Deuteronomy, of hearing the Torah read, is that people would do what? Verse 12, they would fear the Lord, right? Fear the Lord. Now, and and keep reading it aloud every seven years so that verse 13, their children will also learn to fear the Lord. Now, fear is not as fear as if we would be harmed. I think when we hear the word fear, we have a different interpretation that it was intended. In here in Deuteronomy, my greatest fear is that something would happen to my kids. That's not this kind of fear. We all have fears that we deal with. So what kind of fear is this when we say fear of the Lord? You can give an answer. Ah, yes. Ah, absolutely. It's ah, it's, I think of it as an awareness of God's greatness and my insignificance. When you put those two next to each other, There is a certain amount of holy, healthy fear. It's also, it's loving God more than anything else. I fear him in the sense that I put him as my highest priority above everything else in my life. There is nothing that's more important to me than the Lord. So these words are written to continually bring each generation into relationship with Yahweh. So that's the purpose of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a big book, and there is absolutely no way we could unpack it in four weeks. As, all, as for the last two books of Leviticus and Numbers, my goal is to give you overview and perspective that hopefully you'll understand it better and be able to study it on your own. Um, in studying it, I definitely have realized how much I love this book and how much I do want to return to it at some point. Um, so, and I, I mentioned at the beginning that Deuteronomy is more about theology and perspective than following the events and as they actually happened. So, um, 
So in this, we're going to be, in Deuteronomy, we're going to be looking at more of purpose. What is the meaning of these events that have happened? What is the purpose of the Torah? Uh, commentator Block says that um, he actually thinks that this may have been Jesus's favorite of the Old Testament books because it's the one he quotes the most which is interesting. Um, as Deuteronomy 1 opens, Moses is standing before the Israelites, the children of those who had been unfaithful and died, and Moses is here about to die. And he wants to reestablish the covenant Yahweh initially made with the older Israelites at Mount Sinai, at Mount Horeb, with this new generation of younger Israelites. So he actually constructs the form of Deuteronomy in a context that they would have understood. The form of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy mirrors Hittite covenant treaties of that time, from the same time period, of a great suzerain king entering into a treaty with his vassal. So, and I have a little outline for you ladies on your, um, on your class notes, but it starts with what they would call the preamble, Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 5, stating who are the parties participating in this covenant? Then two, the historical prologue, which is going to be one, chapter 1, 6, verses 4, uh, verse 43, of this great suzerain who proclaims what he has done in the past, the historical prologue. Then number three, it's going to be stipulations or terms of the covenant, which is Deuteronomy 4, 44 through 26, 19. Then there's going to be curses and blessings, 27. Deuteronomy 27 and 28. What happens if you don't follow all, these, all this instruction? Um, Deuteronomy 5 is what's called the clause, or sorry, then 5, uh, the document clause, which is Deuteronomy 31. And then finally 6, the witnesses, Deuteronomy 32. And then after that, it kind of breaks down, does not follow the Hittite treaty form. Deuteronomy 33 is the last words of Moses. And 34, a later editor adds in about the death of Moses. So today we're going to be very briefly looking at Deuteronomy 1 through 6. And we'll see the covenant begin to take shape. Now, the question is, why would Moses fashion Deuteronomy after a Hittite covenant treaty? Well, it, I really think it's to give the Israelites context and understanding because it's something they would have been familiar with. He uses a literary form they would have already known, already been familiar with, reminding the Israelites that you also are in a covenant with a great suzerain king. Another reason I think Yahweh uses this covenant form is actually to show how different he is than the little G gods, as Miss Susie, our children's our educator, calls it them, little G gods, not the God. The little G gods worshipped by the other peoples and nations around them. So God is showing through this covenant form how different he is, actually, than the gods that they would have been familiar with. So let me tell you just a little bit for a moment about ancient Near Eastern gods and goddesses. And I have this on your class notes as well. This comes from John Walton in his textbook, Old Testament Today. So one, the ancient Near East people believed their gods had needs like humans. They conducted themselves like humans with shortcomings, weaknesses, desires, frustrations. They were inconsistent and unpredictable. They were not understood to be moral, ethical, or fair. So inconsistent, unpredictable, you never knew what they wanted. They were just flighty like humans. Two, these needy gods had a codependent relationship with people. People provided for the needs of the gods, and the gods therefore gave the people protection and provision. Um, three, the gods offered no permanent revelation of their character. So humans had little guidance for what gods expected of them. And this is fantastic or interesting. I'm going to read to you from, um, this is an ancient Near Eastern prayer that was found. And um, Walton quotes it. So this is the prayer to every god from an ancient Near Eastern document called the Enet. Just listen to how this is different from Yahweh's relationship with his people. This is a person praying. The trans transgression I've committed, I do not know. The sin I have done, I do not know. 
The forbidden thing I've eaten, I do not know. The prohibited place on which I have set foot, I do not know. The God whom I know or do not know has oppressed me. Man is dumb, he knows nothing. Mankind, everyone that exists, what does he know? Whether he is committing sin or doing good, he does not even know. Think about that feeling of never knowing. So that's why horrible things were sometimes done, like child sacrifice, because if you believed you had angered a God and you did not know what you had done, because things are going horribly in your life, so you must have done something bad, you don't know what you've done wrong, so you start doing anything you can to try and hopefully make the gods happy again. That's so, such a scary existence. So, and then fourth and finally, the gods of the ancient Near East, or people believed about them, that a response of people to the gods was ritualistic and appeasing, meaning there's little to suggest that the rituals were accompanied by any personal piety or the religious beliefs made any demand on their personal morality. So live any way you want, just do the rituals that make the gods happy. Does that make sense? So it's not about your inner character or who you are, but just do the rituals so that the gods are happy around you. So in light of this background, let's look for how Yahweh portrays himself as so different than these little G gods and why Moses would use a covenant form to reveal Yahweh to the Israelite community. So we're going to start again in Deuteronomy 1. So in 1.3, Moses says that he is going to proclaim specific instructions to the people. I'll read that one more time. So Deuteronomy 1.3. You can switch back there if you're still in chapter 31, like I was. Okay. These are the words of Moses, spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. So, um, uh, sorry, I need to read a little bit more. Going down to three. Okay. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. So Moses says, he proclaims specific instructions to the Israelites, all that who has commanded. Who's it say? The Lord. All the Lord has commanded. All the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Israelites. So Yahweh, ladies, is giving a very clear revelation of himself in these words in the Torah. It's not a guessing game of what makes him happy or how to appease him. Inherent in a covenant is clear terms between two parties. You want to know how to keep the Lord in, in your presence? You want to know how to stay in the land of Canaan? Here's exactly how to do it. It's clear. It's revealed. It's relationship. So the preamble states the parties, these are the words from Yahweh to the Israelites. So this is who is being included in this contract. This is a covenant between Yahweh and, his Isra and the Israelites. Next comes the historical prologue. What the great suzerain king has done for the vassal already. So in Deuteronomy 1, Moses reviews how Yahweh led them from Horeb, from Mount Sinai, the location of the initial covenant with, the, between the, with their parents, to Canaan, where the spies are sent out to survey the land. It's interesting in this part, Moses actually sounds regretful for sending the spies out. I'm going to read just a little excerpt. So in chapter 1, verses 22 through 26, then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. The idea seemed good to me. It doesn't say that he sought the Lord. It says the idea seemed good to me. So I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and explored it, taking with them some of the fruit in the land and brought it down to us and reported. It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us but you are unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord, your God. So verse 22, who had the idea of spying out the land? It was, it says it was the, the people, right? Not Yahweh. So, and after spying it out, verse 26, they are now unwilling to go up into it. Yahweh had commanded the Israelites to enter Canaan and to take it. But instead they decide to assess it first. And once they assess it, 
it seems too hard. As we have talked about before, they assessed it from their own perspective. They looked at the big people and the big walls, right? They didn't look at their big God. They were led by their perspective of their circumstances. They didn't let God define their perspective of their circumstances. There's likely a lesson there for all of us in that, right? When God says, do something, it seems our response should be faith, not overt analysis, right? Sometimes it's easy to just analyze and analyze and analyze and never take that step of faith the Lord wants us to take. So verse 27 and following, as the Israelites grumble, Moses reminds them of God's character. They know what Yahweh is like. And I'm skipping down to verse 29. Verse 29. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. The Israelites don't have to be terrified. Verse 30 Because God will do what? He will fight for them. They already saw with their own eyes what he did in Egypt. They saw the plagues and how how Egypt, the greatest military power of the day, was defeated. They also saw Yahweh's character in the wilderness. Verse 31, how the Lord your God carried you. Don't you love that? How he carried you like a father carries his son. What do we see, ladies, of the character of God in this image of him carrying his son? What do you see? He provides, protects, nurtures the sense of a father caring, supporting, loving, holding a small child to his chest. It's such a beautiful image. Moses is saying, we know Yahweh's character. He fights for us. He carries us. And we know God's character is still the same today. The character we read of the Lord in Deuteronomy is the same character he is today. He does not change. On this desert journey of life that we are all in right now, journeying to our eventual promised land of rest, Jesus Christ still fights for us. He still carries us. Because God's nature does not change. Moses then reviews the pronouncement that no one older than 20 will enter Canaan. Deuteronomy 2 recounts this desert journey. So we're still in our um, historical assessment. Everything God has already done for the Israelites. Then how only recently they had defeated Sihon, king of Heshbon, Og, king of Bashan. And it's so great because how did they defeat them? So Deuteronomy 2 gives us. 2.31, I'm skipping over to. All right, 2.31. The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sihon and his country over to you. Now begin to conquer and possess his land. Then Sihon and all his army came out to meet us in the battle of Jahaz. The Lord our God delivered him over to us, and we struck him down, together with his sons and his whole army. Okay, so verse 33. Who delivered Sihon over to Israel? The Lord, and same with, ba- with Bashan. Chapter 3, verse 1. And Og, king of Bashan, with his whole army, marched out to meet us in ba- the battle of Edre. The Lord said to me, Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his whole army and his land. Do to him what you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Hezbon. So the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan, and his army. So again, who delivers Og over to Israel? It's the Lord, exactly. So in this historical prologue, Yahweh is reminding the Israelites of his character and how he has already fought for them. Deuteronomy 3 then reviews how the Israelites are to divide the land once they conquer it. We won't go through that. At the end of Deuteronomy 3, Moses recounts his own failure, how he can't enter Canaan, and how Joshua is then commissioned to lead after that. In chapter 4, Moses shifts from recounting their journey 
to recounting what they already know. Remember the laws Yahweh has given us. In our outline of our grand scheme for the class, I titled this the first, our, our, sorry, our four weeks of Deuteronomy with the same heading, Before You Go In. So this is the idea, before you go in, what do you need to know? And so this week, before you go, you go in, is remember the big 10. Remember the 10 commandments. Uh, Moses will here begin to remind the Israelites of the clear instruction Yahweh has given them for maintaining his presence in their midst, for them to enjoy a long life in the sacred space of Canaan that Yahweh is carving out for them. So I'm going to pick up our text in Deuteronomy 4, reading verses 1 through 9. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and the laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God, Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed Baal of Peor. We read about that in Numbers. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded you, as, sorry, commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all your decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. What other nation is so great to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So verse one says to follow these decrees and laws. These are the two words, uh, Hebrew words, choke and mispat. So choke is statues or something prescribed or owned and mispat is for law, meaning judgment or ordinances. So this is not the word Torah here. This is a specific word for, in, for ordinances. Follow these specific statues and ordinances revealed by Yahweh. There's a promise in them. Hear and follow these laws. Why? Why does it say? So they can do what? They can live long. So they can take possession of the land and they can live long in it. These are specific covenant terms to the Israelites in this very specific situation. We don't apply it to our lives that if we follow God, we're going to have a very long life. That's not the promise that we take from this. The promise is for this land, this specific situation. Commentator Block noticed how the land of Canaan is promised to Abe's descendants based on Yahweh's covenant with Abe, Abraham. But this is interesting. But enjoyment of the land is conditional. The land is promised, but enjoyment of it is conditional. Abe's descendants in faith still have to go up and take the land. Canaan, as we know, as we've been talking about in this class, is analogous to heaven. Our promised rest. It's the image of promised rest. So I was thinking about that. It too is offered to all people, right? But we have to take it in faith. Our enjoyment of it is also conditional. Isn't that interesting to think about that connection? Only in faith do we enter it. The promise is there for all people. It is offered to all people. But the question remains, will each person submit to Jesus so that they can enjoy it? We also see again in verse six, it's not all about the Israelites, which is something that I have learned through this study. I think it's so interesting. If they observe Yahweh's instructions carefully, their wisdom will be revealed to all the nations. And nations will notice that Yahweh is different than the little G gods of the nations around them. Verse seven, 
What other nation is so great to have their God near to them? The way the Lord our God is near to us when we pray. What other nation has such righteous decrees and ordinances? So ladies, this is a question I have for you. Based on how I talked about the understanding of the little G-gods of the ancient Near East, how is Yahweh different from the little G-gods? Personal relationship? What else? You know what he wants. Absolutely. Anything else? Clear guidance? Well, over here. He responds when we pray. He's near to us. He dwells with us. He's not far off. He's not something we don't know how to please. And also, his character never changes. And he says in scripture, I'm not like a man that I would change my mind. God's character doesn't change. It remains the same. So we're, there's no question about who he is and how we know him and how we have a relationship with him. So the Israelites are entering into a covenant with a known God, not a whimsical, self-seeking, changing, inconsistent, unable to be pleased, little G God. Moses is saying, remember, you worship a known God, a loving God. Verse nine says, teach a love for this God to your children that they too may continue to receive the blessings of the covenant relationship with Yahweh. Do not forget what your own eyes have seen. The miracles Yahweh has done because he loves you. And don't let them slip from your heart. Heart is a somewhat unused Hebrew word. We'll actually get back to it in a minute. Again, it's the word labab, meaning inner self, mind, will, or heart. So let what you have seen Take deep root inside of you. Don't forget it. Teach it to your children and your grandchildren. That is the call for all of us too, ladies, to teach a love for Jesus to our children, to our grandchildren, to anyone in the next generation that we have influence on. We can all be involved in passing down a love for Jesus to the next generation. How does Jesus want you to be passing down your love for the Lord to the next generation, whether you have children or grandchildren or not? So continuing in Deuteronomy 4, Moses recounts how Yahweh gave them the Ten Commandments at Horeb. Uh, the Ten Commandments is only an English translation. It literally simply is the ten words, which we call the Decalogue. So anytime you see that theological phrase, Decalogue, it simply refers to the ten words. Ten words spoken. Uh, Yahweh gives them on two stone tablets. Now, people have wondered why two stone tablets were half the words written on one and half the words written on the other. But commentator Block mentions how in ancient Near Eastern covenants or treaties, two copies of the treaty would have been written, each on a stone tablet. Each party would then take their copy, their stone tablet, with them back to where they came from. So if you think of a vassal king and his little, or the, sorry, the suzerain king and his little vassal that submits to him, each would have their own um, stone tablet of the covenant and the treaty they have made between them. So it's significant, and I even want to think about this more. I didn't think about, I have not spent enough time thinking about it. So if you have any fantastic ideas, I'd love to hear them, ladies. I think it's significant that Moses takes both pieces of the treaty. He takes both pieces of the stone tablets, Yahweh's and the people's, and puts them both in the ark. So I think there's some significance there I would like to ponder or read about some more. So think about that one and come back to me if you have any great ideas. Why would he put both sides of the treaty in the Ark of the Covenant? It seems to me that it's holding both sides accountable together right there inside the ark which the ark functions as the footstool for the Lord, that his presence is above the, the ark of the covenant. Again, both sides of the treaty are contained within it. So we'll ponder that one and come back to me with your ideas. So the end of Deuteronomy 4, Moses gives the reason Yahweh made a covenant with the Israelites. So verse, or chapter 40, sorry, chapter 4, verse 32 
says, Ask now about the former days long before your time, from the day God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything so great as this ever happened? Has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire? He's referring to Mount Horeb or Sinai. As you have and lived, has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Beside him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you. Hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire and you heard his words from out of the fire because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven, above, on on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. So God has revealed himself, verse 35. So the Israelites... And all the nations would know that Yahweh is who? He is, he is God. And there is no other God beside him. Why did he choose the Israelites as a means to reveal himself? Verse 37, it says, because he did what? He loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them. Yahweh chose them simply because he loves them. It was an act of grace from the very beginning. The response Yahweh wants in return is to love him back, to make love for him the core of who the Israelites are, the core of who we are. In Deuteronomy 5, Moses reiterates the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue to the people, I'm not going to go through them today because we spent a full day on them in February. So if you want to listen to commentary on the Big Ten, go back to the February 9th episode. And we went through the whole, which we titled Moses Receives the Big Ten. And I gave you a lot of perspective on the Ten Commandments then. Context is super important to understanding them. Yahweh perceived the Israelites as redeemed people. The Israelites saw themselves as already saved. Yahweh had saved them from Egypt, from enslavement. We too are redeemed people, set free from slavery to sin. So the big 10 are given to people already redeemed, already saved. They're not given to the Canaanites or the Amorites around them. The big 10 don't lead to salvation, ladies. They answer the question, how do redeemed people live in covenant with Yahweh and in community with each other? How do we live in covenant with God and in community with each other to those who are already saved? In covenant, they are to put Yahweh first. I have no other gods before me. Love him above everything else. And how do they treat each other? Love their neighbor as themselves. Jesus doesn't say anything revolutionary when he says, love God and love people. He's simply reiterating the basis of the Big Ten, what people already know. Because Yahweh loves his people, he tells them clearly how to be in relationship with him, how to maintain holy space and holy community so that he can tabernacle among them. It's not a guessing game. Clear revelation because he loves his people. Commentator Block made this beautiful point. The Torah is grace. The gift of grace to redeemed people to guide them in the way of righteousness. 
because the other nations did not have clear instruction or revelation. Torah is grace. It's God's gift to his people so that they would know him and be in relationship with him. The Apostle Paul, it's interesting, criticizes those who see the law or Torah as a means to salvation, but he does not criticize it itself. He perce- the Apostle Paul per- perceives Torah correctly as a result of salvation. I'm going to read one more quote to you. This is from commentator Block from his NIV application commentary on Deuteronomy. This is what he says. Paul was in perfect step with Moses. Obedience to the law was not a means for gaining salvation, but a willing and grateful response to salvation already received. There is nothing revolutionary in Paul's definition of a true Jew as one who perceives the pra- one who receives the praise of God because he, ha- he is circumcised in the heart. One thing we're going to go on to see more in Deuteronomy is that there is a definition that are distinguishment made between a true Israelite and one that is not a true Israelite. A true Israelite is not someone who is just an Israelite by birth. It is someone who loves God with our whole heart, their whole mind, and their whole soul. So I thought that was so powerful, seeing how Apostle Paul is not saying anything new. It's something that they already knew, to love God, to love others. That's the core of who they are. The right response to this love, this gift of salvation, is to love back. Because they are saved, because they are redeemed, because God has carried them so far and wants a relationship with them, the right response is to love back. We love because Yahweh or Jesus first loved us. Which brings us to Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directing me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you so that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Those are such beautiful words, aren't they? These are the covenant words for a specific situation. Love Yahweh. And verse 3, enjoy long life in this land Yahweh is giving you. Teach these commands to your children so they too can possess this land and live there a long time. So they could remain in covenant with Yahweh. Our covenant is no longer a covenant of land and place as it was for the Israelites. Canaan, as mentioned, is symbolic of heaven, of our final rest. So we are to teach a love for the Lord, for Jesus, so our children will walk in the blessing of the Lord as it is great blessing to walk close to the Lord. And so they too will enter the final rest of presence with him in the future. Look at the three words that are used to describe how we love God. Verse 5, the NIV says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. These are beautiful. We love these words. Commentator Block translates these three Hebrew words just a little bit differently. So heart is the Hebrew word lub. I have this on your class notes. Um, In the ancient Near East, the heart was the seat of emotions in a person but equally would refer to the mind because they felt the heart was also sort of the seat of thought, where thought came from too. So lab comprehensively refers to both heart and mind. That's the sense that's in, involved in it. Soul is the word nepes, which in Hebrew, uh, 
Vlock translates as person. He says nepes actually means throat and is used metaphorically for appetite, desire, life, or even your whole self. Here he says nepes refers to a sense of the entire person. Strength is ma'ad in Hebrew, which Block translates as substance. Block says ma'ad typically means greatly or exceedingly. And he says here the meaning is best captured by the word resources, which includes physical strength and also economic or social strength. Even physical things one owns, like tools or livestock or a house. So Block sees a progression in how we love God. And this is the, what I put on your notes. He made these concentric circles that I really liked. So the idea that in the inner block is your inner heart, your mind. It starts with our inner being. And then we progress outwardly to our whole person. And then all that we claim as our own. So we love God with our inner being, our mind, our thoughts. We love God in what we do, the choices of our whole life, our whole person. We love God in what we own, what we govern, what is under our authority, how we use these things. So that, ladies, is what I, oh, I entered perfectly on time. Um, I would love for you ladies to think about those three things, either in journaling or in discussion. Think or talk about what does it mean for you personally to love Jesus with your inner self, your heart, your mind, your whole self, your life, your choices, and then your substance, all that you own or possess. Another question you could think about and talk about is, we are all commanded to teach a love for the Lord to the next generation. What does it look like for you? Because not all of us in this room have children or grandchildren, but I think we are all called to teach a love for the Lord to the next generation. So what does that look like? How do we pass on a love for Jesus? to others around us, especially those younger than us. So you can also just share any observations from today and then share any prayer requests that you have for this week. So I know that was a lot, ladies, but I hope, I hope that you have a little bit of a different or bigger perspective on what Deuteronomy is, the intention behind it. Babs, do you have a question? Oh, let's hear it. It's beautiful. My understanding is that um, the Jewish, the two times a day Jewish prayers begin with the Shema. So twice a day, think about the amount of times that a Jewish person will be reciting these words. Your morning prayers and your evening prayers, twice a day, hear O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul. It's, it's powerful. That is a great point, um, that the mezuzahs that you see on a Jewish doorpost these are the words that are contained inside of them. And actually, I, you know, there's too much to get through in one day, but the commentator I was reading was saying how, what a beautiful thing to think about putting it on. So when it says to put it on your gates, that would have been like their, um, you know, the gates around their entire town, which is also where the elders would have met and sat to make judgments. So think about having the word of God being in front of a council as they're making a decision. You know, think about it being on your home, marking your home. My home is a house that represents the Lord. My house is a house where the Lord lives. And so the commentator was saying, maybe it's not us putting the Shema, you know, the mezuzah on our doorpost, but are there ways that we can mark our house very clearly as belonging to the Lord when people enter it? And I was like, I was kind of challenged by that. I thought that was, um, I like that. I want to think about that for my own house. Yeah, extra training. It's amazing. I'll let you ladies talk amongst yourselves for, oh, she was just kind of sharing her personal story. Um, I'll let you ladies talk amongst yourselves um, with these questions. I'll put on music for a few minutes and then I'll close those at 1045.